Okay, well, uh, welcome everyone to today's session titled uh, Leveraging Analytical Laboratories to Lower Barriers to Fa Fair Data. Uh, my name is Natalie Rea. I'm a postdoc at the School of Information at the University of Arizona. Um, and I'm co-convening this session today with Christina Vrauenvelder, uh, Program Manager for Open Science Leadership at AGU. Um, I... Thanks. We have a session structure today that features uh, four short, about seven minute-ish talks uh, with time for a few questions after each. And so you're welcome to put those in the chat or raise your hand after each talk. Um, and after that, we'll have a group-wide Jamboard facilitated discussion. We have some questions and prompts for the group, uh, and then we'll have some synthesis and wrap up. And so um, please be sure to add your name in the session notes today, uh, particularly if you're interested in, in staying connected. Um, the motivation for this session today is to engage in uh, kind of a high level method agnostic discussion centered around the question, uh, what role can analytical laboratories play in driving production and publication of FAIR data? Um, and we'd particularly like to drive the dis dis discussion with a lens focused on the ways that analytical labs can enable and empower scientists to be successful uh, in producing and publishing their data. Um, and to do this by focusing on places where um, existing time, effort, and data education barriers uh, can be reduced for those researchers. And so analytical labs are engaged with researchers at a further upstream stage of the data life cycle than places where many uh, of these researchers are currently beginning to interact with uh, data repositories and the impacts of things like missing metadata um, and standard reporting. So uh, analytical labs have this potential power to affect change that has uh, downstream effects on the quality and the reusability of data beyond just the collection portion of the data lifecycle, which um, we're showing on the screen here. Um, and also to speak on our meeting theme this week, analytical labs are often also existing centers for trust and method specific expertise. And so they hold this added power for catalyzing uh, uptake of fair data practices uh, within, within their specific communities of users. Um, and as with many of the efforts presented this week, uh, there's of course a history of past and ongoing work in this space. And so today's goals are uh, to hear about these ongoing efforts in some of this context, uh, to discuss the landscape of stakeholders involved uh, to do some visioning for needs and future engagement, and finally to consider uh, possible ESIP-based actions. And so I'll hand it off to Christina to talk a little bit about some context. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, Natalie already introduced me, but um, I do work for EGU, so we publish uh, 24 journals in the Earth and Space Science. I'm the program manager of Open Science. I work with Shelley Stahl. And I have just been having an amazing, wonderful time at ESIP this week, learning about the community efforts that are supporting data and software sharing across the earth and space sciences. Natalie and I wanted to put this session together uh, because Natalie as a researcher and now a postdoc and I who work directly with our authors and researchers at AGU are constantly confronted with the question, as, as Natalie said, of how do we make fair data an easier target for researchers? How do we lower barriers to achieving that? Um, and there's already a lot of work going on in this context that I wanna acknowledge here. Um, I had the pleasure of attending an NSF workshop this summer um, hosted by Matt Mayernick, among others at NCAR uh, on fair facilities and instruments. Uh, and this work is also very closely tied to a research data alliance working group, the persistent identification of instruments. Um, the RCN workshop um, is preparing a report that will be published soon, I think, uh, but one thing to come out of that was the importance of assigning persistent identifiers to facilities and instruments, enabling linkages between data sets and facilities and instruments. 
Um, the Persistent Identification of Instruments Working Group has done a lot of work that also supports that, including a metadata structure for instruments. Um, this work, I think, has um, implications beyond just the earth space and environmental science. There are a lot of domains uh, that are dealing with the same issues. Um, Kirsten Leonard's session on Monday touched on tomography. Um, this is an instrument type that's used across domains, uh, just as an example. And uh, I want to mention for that reason, a research data alliance interest group uh, that we are working on standing up, the FAIR Instrument Data Interest Group, um, which could serve as a place for multidisciplinary cross-domain work on this issue. Uh, if you're interested in that kind of uh, work, then you can join the group for updates. We're working on a charter right now uh, through that QR code. Um, to continue giving that context and background, I'm going to hand it off now uh, to Kirsten Leonard, who is going to take us through uh, a little bit of background on one geochemistry's efforts uh, towards data standardization in the in that discipline. Uh, so Kirsten, uh, really excited to hear from you about the work that you've been doing here before we move into our speakers. Yeah, just thanks uh, actually for including me, obviously. I mean, this is a very uh, timely session, I think, to think about the the role of analytical labs, because I fully agree that that's where uh, a lot of the implementation can happen. Um, so for those of you who haven't heard about One Geochemistry, I'm just going to give a very brief introduction. Uh, and please, if you're interested in it, in participation or learning more, please contact me. Or I think Leslie Wyburn is also on the call and uh, would definitely be happy to uh, give you more information or get you involved. So One Geochemistry is an international initiative that started in about 2019, 2018-19, uh, aiming to uh, improve the use of geochemical data in a broad range of science through data standardization. And it is um, basically driven by a a group of organizations uh, that are in part data repositories, uh, data facilities for geochemistry, but also uh, science networks such as the European Plate Observing System and uh, networks of laboratories such as the Australian Geochemistry Network uh, or NFDI for Earth, another example in Germany of um, and bringing together communities that, that include geochemistry labs. Uh, One Geochemistry has um, worked to actually be, um, be made aware uh, in the geochemistry community and has received endorsement as an organization that helps establishing standards in geochemistry by a range of um, societies that have a relation to geochemistry. Can you give me the next slide? Uh, so the strategy that One Geochemistry has employed is to first establish an organizational structure uh, to actually have a way to make decisions that are community-based, and then to find funding to support uh, its activities. Uh, and then it has really focused on engaging the community uh, in these developments of standards that are now only starting to happen. Uh, can you give me next slide? So in the um, community engagement, uh, One Geochemistry has not only reached out to researchers, to other repositories, to publishers and funders, but it has also reached out to instrument manufacturers. And I wanted to specifically emphasize this in, in the context of this session. Uh, we have a couple of years ago, a year and a half ago now, uh, at the Goldschmidt Conference in Hawaii, we organized a meeting with instrument manufacturers uh, to talk exactly about this issue. How can we uh, streamline the flow of data and metadata from instruments into data systems that support uh, the work in the lab and then onwards into the repositories and the databases that make uh, the information accessible. So I really hope that uh, a connection can be established between what is coming out here today 
and all these other efforts that are going on. May, may, it may be imagery, it may be other analytical techniques that are being employed. And the diff another aspect actually here is also the samples that are being analyzed and their linkages to the instruments, to the labs and so on, the relevance of uh, persistent identification of samples. Uh, so last slide that I have, I just wanted to emphasize uh, that one geochemistry is clearly recognizing it's not alone in the world. And there are a lot of standards already out there that as, as the community of geochemists, we can take advantage of and uh, make sure that our data can be accessed and reused. On, in a very broad scale. So One Geochemistry is participating in a very powerful project that is funded uh, in Europe, the World Fair project, but it is a very international project executed uh, jointly by CoData and the Research Data Alliance and has these 11 different case studies uh, that establish fair data within their domain, but with an eye very open uh, towards what other domains have. And geochemistry works very closely here with chemistry, with nanomaterials, uh, and to uh, see which, which vocabularies, which structures, data structures, and so on we can share. And I think this is important, especially here in the context of analytical instrumentation, which is not only used in geochemistry, but in many other domains, be it in you know, biology and medicine and so on. So this dialogue across domains is also really important. That was my info. Thank you. Thank you so much, Karisin, for um, giving us that tie-in. Um, we're going to now have a series of short talks uh, from others who are working in this field. And we're going to start out with Erin Robinson, who will need no introduction um, to this crowd, but I'll, I'll make an attempt at one anyway. Um, she is the co-founder of Metadata Game Changers, a former executive director of ESIP. And she's going to give a talk, uh, planning for fair and care data before field work begins. So Erin, please take it away. Thank you so much. And actually, you know, I think the ESIP crowd is changing every meeting. Um, so I suspect I, I, I appreciate the introduction because um, I think there's some faces I don't know. Um, so I really wanted to talk, I'm one, I'm grateful to the organizers for being included. I'm also gonna start my timer um, because I work with field stations, biological field stations, and often, um, they are like laboratories, but they aren't always binned with laboratories. And so I'm excited to be in this session and talk about the kind of things that we're thinking about um, and really um, thinking about the planning phase, because what we found, just to cut to the chase, is that people come to field stations, they're incredibly important at the beginning of the work, and then they go back to their home institutions and all of the data um, goes with them. And the, the data has a really hard time being linked back to the place. And so I'll explain this picture more in just a few slides. It goes without saying that we are in a time of incredible change um, and incredible loss. And one of the ways that we understand that loss is through field, um, field science and through ecology and biology and um, going out into the field. And we really value our natural history museums because they bring all of those samples back together and it allows us to um, look at them across space and across time. But it really, I think one of the things we lose here at times is the connection back to place. And so this gives you a sense of the coverage of um, marine stations. So these are just the coastal stations. There's about 800 of these marine stations around the world. Um, it's hard to know the exact number because um, they go by different names. So you might hear them being called marine labs. You might hear them being called research centers, um, but all of them offer this capacity to support researchers logistically um, and more and more what I'm looking at is how do field stations support them with their data management practices um, to provide this platform to launch research. And so 
um, I previewed this um, kind of rupture that we're seeing, but when data and samples are taken away from the field, um, then we they lose their connection to the places and from those that steward it. This is, you know, when I originally started doing this work with the Fair Island project, we were really concerned about connecting um, samples and their, their downstream research back to the field station so that the field stations could get credit. What I'm gonna talk about more is that we're also seeing field stations as part of places and those places have people um, and often indigenous communities that are part of those places and they have rights over the, the samples and the research that's being done. Um, and so this is um, a graphic that I created that's part of a poster and the citation is down here at the bottom. Um, but one of the things that we do see field stations doing is repairing this connection back to place. And so they're going and they're searching manually for publications and for data sets and trying to create um, this set of information that then future researchers could build on top of, but it's really hard. So the two field stations that I work with, I have a rough job. Um, I work in French Polynesia with a field station on Morea and a field station on this small atoll, Tetiaroa. Um, the field station on Morea is managed by Gump. It's called Gump and it's managed by Berkeley and was established in 1985. And then Tetiaroa gives us an interesting um, contrast because it's newer, it was established in 2014, um, which is 10 years old, but in field station life, lifespans, that's actually a fairly new station. And it's also privately um, managed. Uh, it's managed by a nonprofit. And that gives us some ability to do some experimenting on more intensive data management practices or trying things out. Um, so one of the first things that we've done is we've looked at this biocode project, which was done in 2008. Um, and it was a sampling, an intensive sampling project on Morea. Um, where they sampled um, from the reef to the ridge and they um, did a, an interesting thing. So in addition to the science, which was interesting, they also all used this field information management system, Geome. So here you can see one example of an event that's linked to a sample and then all of the samples are here. And what was cool about that to me is that because they all use the same information management system, they all used a common you know, a common repository. When I samples came along, Kirsten can maybe put this in the chat, um, a decade or more later, um, I samples was able to harvest geome and was able to show all of the samples that were there um, here. So this is Maria uh, Gump, the field station that I was mentioning is right here with these towers. And this is, um, I think a really interesting thing that we can do when we think about how to manage data um, ahead of time. So a lot of the work that I do is thinking about how field stations connect into the global research infrastructure. How do we fix that connection? And so we realized that field stations have most power at the, the planning and the collection phase um, when scientists are going into the field. So we've been doing a lot of work around project metadata and how are projects connected to notices, to protocols, to data management plans, and to their downstream um, products. And so where we are right now is that we have the ability to submit this project application, to review it, to give it a DOI, and then to give it a notice, and then the actual field work commences. And so this is a first step towards both FAIR and CARE. And our, our idea is that if their project has a DOI, um, that they will researchers may consider citing their project in downstream publications, and we can leverage the global research infrastructure network that I was just showing um, as we move forward. Um, so this is what that kind of network map looks like or this graph looks like. So here I'm showing um, the pink dots are projects um, and then their related, uh, you know, related outputs um, like their output management plans, their protocols um, and data sets. They're connected to the field stations, which are these green dots. And then we can have a hierarchy of projects. And so these four projects are part of a bigger project, the Island Sustainability Program, which is um, actually a student study abroad um, class that comes to Gump once a year. Um, and so I worked them through this infrastructure um, and our approach last year, and they were some of the first to create these projects and then for us to show these connections. And so there's a blog post on that work. 
And what that allows us to do when we have the connection to the field station and we have these projects is that when we can then leverage data site commons, um, which is something that we didn't have to fund or build. And we can see for the field station, it has an identifier. And we can see we went back and we retrospectively made projects and published projects for all of the project applications for Tetiaroa. And so you can see that starting in 2014, 2015, um, we have this kind of pattern of, of applications and you can see um, the contributors, you can look by time, you can start to use the facets. Um, and it's a very, I think, interesting thing to be able to use this dashboard, which is meant for any organization, for field stations and for labs. Another really um, sort of very different way of viewing that same information is through this journal overlay that we've been working on for Tetiaroa. So here you can see, this is a mock-up of what such a journal, a journal might look like, um, but it really is meant to show the science, the culture and the legal aspects of doing field work. Um, and I'll put the, the link in the chat. Um, but for an application, I was mentioning that we're publishing these applications. So this is an example of a um, prior work that we, a prior project that we have used as an example, and this is their application. And so this is what it looks like when it's published. And then you can see the links to the data. We could, you know, take the links to, from data site um, and just sort of beginning to see what it looks like to mock this up completely. Um, I want to call out specifically that one of the things that we can do in the project metadata is to add local context information. So this is a notice that we created for that project. This is what it looks like in data site commons. You can see the label. And then in the publication, we would have all of the notices and all of the labels that had been received from the community um, with that um, published so that people could see that happening at the field station. So one of the things we've struggled with is where do DMPs fit into this? And um, a very interesting DMP is this uh, DMP data management plan from Hakai um, on their juvenile sample program. And you can see in this um, screenshot on the right of the from Data Site Commons that this group is doing a lot of linking back to their DMP. So now what we're thinking is that when people are coming to the field station, we're gonna require them to start their project application with the DMP. We're then gonna have a little bit more back and forth with the local context notices, going to the cultural advisory board and returning a label, and then they'll get a DOI. And then their planned metadata will go to Geome that I mentioned earlier, and then their actual field work will commence. And we think that by linking the DMP to the project, to the planned metadata, that we will, um, we will have um, more fair and care data um, coming out of field station work. So with that, thanks very much. Thank you so much, Erin. I really like the DMP connection. You know, this is something that we talk to researchers a lot about. And for some you know, significant number of researchers, the publisher or the DMP from the funder are their first sort of uh, serious interaction with managing their data and software for in, in the sharing context. Uh, we have a few minutes for questions. Does anyone have a question for Erin? And one quick thing I'll just add on that, Christina, is that what we're thinking is that a lot of times people do those do their DMP and then they don't really ever come back to them. And so we're experimenting with this idea of like coming back to the DMP and then thinking about how you implement it. Yeah, making the DMP actually matter beyond just the box checking exercise. Yeah. If there are no questions for Erin, you can think about it and always drop them into the chat uh, later. Uh, and we'll go ahead and move on to David Quinn, uh, who is our next speaker. Uh, David is a research scientist in the Macrostrat Lab at University of Wisconsin-Madison and the project lead for Sparrow, a data system for geochemistry labs. Uh, so David, you can just go ahead and you share your slides and take it away. David, we're not Hello, can you all? Through, we're not quite seeing your see? slides. Oh, you aren't seeing my slides. Are you seeing anything or? Seeing I a can... bar across the middle. Oh, 
Okay, I'll just uh, I'll just share this the uh, old fashioned way. Um, Beautiful. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Perfect. Uh, perfect. Well, thanks so much for the invite to speak to this group. Um, and um, yeah, I'm excited to share uh, some work that we've done over the last five years on building software to um, try to work with analytical labs. And I think um, given the pensive title of my talk, I think, uh, you know, I have real questions about whether we are able to effectively work across domains on building software in a way that uh, makes researchers' lives easier and in a way that we're actually going to do because we all don't have the time to do anything other than what we're already doing. So um, with that broad frame, I'm going to try to deliver on that and, and just kind of first introduce why I'm thinking about analytical instruments at all. I'm a structural geologist and I don't typically work in labs anymore. I used to um, and was not very good at it. And so I uh, stuck to banging on rocks. Um, but um, I am maintaining a data system called MacroStrat, which is essentially a um, a uh, description of the Earth's crustal framework uh, with geologic maps and stratigraphic columns. Um, and this has been a fairly successful data system over the last decade or so. Um, and one of the cool things you can do with it is actually hang information into this framework. Uh, in this case, the Tritol Zircon Ages uh, uh, produced into Tritol Zircon Laboratories. And you can um, use uh, the names and metadata about that uh, geochronology to uh, hang it into individual units, reference it to stratigraphic columns and geologic maps. And then with that, you can build a crustal framework um, that has data in space and time organized uh, and, and basically use it as the bookkeeping tool by which you can do cool science and um, make uh, long duration uh, records of the Earth's past and do that all much more efficiently than you could do when you were managing all the data uh, kind of by hand. So this is kind of a really exciting platform that we're hoping to build for kind of a digital representation of the crust. Um, and it kind of calls on a lot of the resources that were being talked about here in terms of uh, data being pulled together in different formats. Um, but what we became conscious of, especially dealing with um, kind of geochronology data and things that are produced in academic labs uh, that tend to be very small, is this kind of last mile problem of data systems, which is that um, we can build really well architected and automated data systems for working with um, structured data, but there's always a problem, um, especially for data uh, in kind of the long tail that, uh, you know, it comes out of, uh, if you're lucky, Excel sheets, or if you're unlucky, PDFs um, going back decades. And there's a lot of manual work to actually track that, but the data is very valuable. So um, you want to be able to use it to build out these frameworks. And so thinking more closely about um, labs particularly geochronology labs, but also this applies to a lot of geochemistry labs. Um, academic geology labs still live in a world of Excel. Um, and when you look at a laboratory data archive, it often has thousands of files um, spanning uh, the entire lifetime of the lab with a kind of mostly standardized, but kind of human uh, edited data format over time, uh, different per lab. Um, and they don't have the funding or expertise to really get a data workflow that's better than that or the time uh, to do it um, because they're just trying to get as many samples to pay for their operations. Um, but be, on the other side of that, labs feel a sense of ownership of their data. They often feel that if other people are stewarding their data, they're mismanaging it in some way. Um, and they also want to track and receive credit. And they also like have the willingness to put in a lot of work in curating their data sets. So they, they are in a lot of ways, good data owners. Um, they just uh, don't have the technical tools. So this is a grant that I came to work on at the start of my postdoc that was geared towards solving this problem. And it basically tried to get a consortium of geochronology labs together with uh, some of the data users, MacroStrap being one of them and other data systems uh, to kind of build a pipeline from the labs to the uh, community users. And so the vision here was to basically, um, for different types of lab data pipelines in different subfields of geochronology, connect them to um, the community with 
kind of automated APIs, but in a way that really prioritized um, the benefits to the labs so that it was a data system that the labs would be willing to run and manage on their own. Uh, so that is kind of a tall order, but we embarked on it. Um, and uh, so we came up with this software, which we called Sparrow, um, which is couched as a uh, data management system for geochemistry and geochronology labs. And it's designed to be kind of a small footprint thing that is housed within a lab, ideally to the extent possible managed by lab staff with some IT help um, and really method agnostic. So it kind of can augment a lot of different geochronology, geochemistry lab workflows. And so the data structure is kind of a sample, standard sample-based data structure that's slowly evolving where we track individual data points that are um, nested into analyses and sessions and samples, have some project level metadata. Um, and then we can also have more community relevant data curation overlays like um, DOIs, ORCIDs, IGSNs uh, that could be tracked in this system as well. And these are things that the labs do not track in any way in their Excel workflows. And so how a lab would use this system is basically you start with your Excel spreadsheet, you write some importer scripts in Python generally, and um, those create structured data for a subset of your file um, to pass information that would be relevant for like kind of tracking the broad result set um, and basically create these structured data records. And so those are tracked in the Sparrow database. And so the first way that you could interact with Sparrow once you've done this import step as a lab is by just looking at this relational database. We're basically putting things into a standard PostgreSQL format. So, um, and, and this is one thing that I try to harp on with labs that there are huge benefits even just from that. Uh, because when you have a relational database, you can actually do things like long time scale aggregate analyses very quickly um, rather than you know, traversing thousands of files to look at standards over time. And the labs have staff that are doing this type of work. So it's like, okay, if you can do the work up front, then, you know, you're going to derive some benefits. Um, the other thing that we try to do as kind of a, um, a reason that the labs might want to get involved in this is have a web management platform that makes it actually kind of nice to work with your samples. And so you can kind of link back to the Excel files, but also see the structured data kind of project level views, um, the basic uh, structured data that's in there uh, and make it nice so that the labs kind of want to work with this system. And then the final way that you can interact with this, which isn't that relevant for the labs, but it's very relevant for outside systems is um, with the standardized API that faces outwards so that um, Macrostrat or geochron.org or IGSN or other systems can kind of pull from the lab and so the lab doesn't have to fulfill data requests and push their data out to the community. The community can come get their data um, from them. That's kind of the idea of this last step, how it connects the community. So um, this is what we designed and built. Um, and this is all great. And we had, you know, kind of 10 different laboratories, about five of which were on the original grant and five of which kind of came in afterwards who um, kind of bought into this and said, okay, we'll try it out. We'll see how it works. And, you know, built some prototype implementation. Some of those worked pretty well. Um, it had some postdocs that, and graduate students that built importer pipelines. Uh, but, you know, we're five years into this. Um, and how is it really working? And the sad truth is we have one fully operational pipeline, one lab that is using this tool. Uh, and when I say using it, I mean not they have it up. Several of these labs have a version of this up, but they are using it, using it on a daily basis to work with their samples, to manage and track their data. Um, it's one lab. And so, you know, this turned out to be really hard to get off the ground. Um, and so we've got a lot of software built, but it's only operational in one place. Um, and we're trying to figure out what the next steps are here. Um, and so kind of my conclusions after this, I mean, this was obviously like, my entire post PhD early career up to this point. So it was a big learning process for me, but um, you know, that the labs really lack expertise in key places. This is not their core task and they don't, you know, it always kind of pushes back in the pipeline. And I think the fact that the pandemic happened during this is no, um, you know, is 
doesn't help because basically it, uh, you know, they were just trying to keep the lights on. And so for the next iteration, we can do some things a little better, you know, kind of better uh, provide uh, support for basic server mechanics uh, and stuff like that, um, and then ensure adequate stack resources. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a tough thing to get off the ground. And so the first big kind of larger scale problem that I think this illuminates is that like, we have a big problem with having enough people with hybrid skill sets uh, here. And what I mean by hybrid skill sets is somebody who understands Python and understands the instrument and workflow. And students and postdocs aren't going to do this work unless it's really a priority, unless it's rewarded and taught. So, um, you know, we had graduate students who could do this work, but weren't able to carve out the time to do it or who were, you know, didn't know the basics and, and it was hard for them to learn it in the time that they needed to learn it. And, you know, it's just a hard problem to solve. Um, the other wider point um, is kind of about I think the structure of community collaboration um, and how we collaborate on software, because I think we're kind of building this in, in a way that may not be the most efficient way. And so, you know, we as informaticists are like um, looking at all of these subfields of science that are happily working with their PDFs and Excel sheets and saying, oh, you, we could do this better. We can help you do it better. And then we built organizations like EarthCube uh, that have really taken as their goal to like embed geoinformatics experts in different fields of geoscience to kind of help out build new processes. Um, and that's really promising as an approach. But I think what it's kind of led to in certain cases is um, those become silos. So the geochronology community is, is looking at Sparrow and it's like, this is our software that we're going to use and our needs are very different than anybody else's needs. And then there's these different silos that are in different subfields. Um, and I really saw that with Sparrow because when it worked out in my day-to-day -day working on Sparrow, the project structure was like eight geochronologists, uh, two people who knew anything about software. And then those people were always leaving for the private sector because uh, you know it's, uh, richer out there. Um, and so it was like, how do we, you know, it was hard to make decision. You were just getting decision fatigue because who are you even talking to about the technical stuff? You know, so like there was all this, like it should work better, but then, you know, how do you make it work better? So it's kind of a lonely affair. And then we have these different silos in different, um, different subfields of geoscience. Um, you know, we've got macro strat working on stratigraphy, Stratus, Bot, Mindat, EarthChem, and like, we're all kind of collaborating, but we're kind of collaborating at the PI level more. Um, you know, when have I last gotten the pull request on our GitHub repository from somebody in another organization? It doesn't happen very often. Uh, and so I think this is kind of an activation energy problem. That's what I would say is that we're working separately right now in a way that it's really hard to get over the hump to work more efficiently and figure out, okay, we're gonna devote a lot of time to looking outwards rather than looking at our near-term task list, but like it might be something that we should really think about what to do. And so what I would propose is like, we need a new architecture where we really prioritize code level collaboration between different subfields to kind of not build the same stack in different silos over and over again. And I think as geologists, we use software libraries all the time. We don't yet create them. Other fields, even in the earth sciences, are doing a better job of creating and maintaining software libraries collaboratively. So as geologists, we need to start kind of doing this. And particularly for user interface software, which I think is kind of unglamorous. Um, it takes a humongous amount of time to do, but like it's really key to like making this stuff palatable for scientists, working scientists. And you know, we're all trying to build really nice user interfaces. We should be doing that work together. And so just to round out, we're kind of starting to try to do this a little bit. We're starting to try to share user interface components between MacroStrat and Sparrow. This is kind of an easy sell because they're both created by the same group right now. And so it's like when Sparrow is well-funded, we can do the work on that side. When MacroStrat is well-funded, we can do the work on that side. Um, we're also starting more excitingly to um, do work that's kind of shared with other organizations. Uh, we just got a grant with Stravospot, part of which is uh, focused on linking the technical teams and sharing development workloads between them. And so if we're able to do this successfully, where two uh, 
organizations that are focused on different scientific communities and needs are nonetheless able to share some effort, it's going to be, I think, very helpful to eliminate whether this can happen as a field going forward. So I will leave it there. Thanks so much for your time and any questions. Thanks, David. Um, I have so many uh, things to say about the incentives for researcher side of this, uh, but there's been a lot of big conversation happening in the chat so I, about the um, the data archiving side. And I want to invite, is there anyone who wants to ask a question more specifically? I think we're going to keep moving along in the interest of time. If you have a question, feel free to pop it in the chat. And I do want to say again, just how uh, terrific that presentation was, David, and I was just nodding along the whole time. I'm going to hand it off to Natalie now to introduce our next speaker. Yeah, David, you've set this up really nicely with your last slide here, because our next speaker is uh, Julie Newman from Texas A&M University. And Julie will be speaking to uh, Strabo Spot and the community driven value added. And so Julie, go ahead and take it away. Okay, thank you. Okay, can you see my slide there? Yep, looks good. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so thanks so much for including this. I, um, yeah, it does follow really well from Dave and thanks, thanks for um, putting out all of those issues so well that we've been dealing with all along. Um, so I'd like to talk about our approach um, to developing this database. Um, data system, which was community driven and value added. So um, from the beginning, Strava Spot has been a community driven effort. And that was actually really critical to having the community adopt it. And we also knew, as we've been discussing, that people don't want to do something that's difficult. So um, they're going to more easily adopt something if it's value added, if we bring a new tool that actually makes their work easier. So that was our focus. And I'm going to talk about these two aspects of Strava Spot development today. Um, there's going to be some redundancy with the talk that Basil Tiroff gave on Tuesday, so I apologize to those participants. So our community, the structural geology and tectonics community, was uh, slow to develop um, a digital data, data system. Our main challenge is that our data are spatially referenced and image-based. Um, and of course, we also shared the challenges that other communities are having with finding data and data management taking place as an afterthought and many of the issues that David described really well. So our approach to the development was to work with the community. So the initial development took place during a series of community workshops of about 10 to 40 participants. So we learned what the community wanted. We developed standardized vocabulary and metadata and we tried to understand the preferred workflows. But most importantly, by involving the community, we got buy-in. So the individuals who participated in these early efforts were also early adopters um, of the Strabo applications and, and cheerleaders for Strabo as we went forward. Um, having one database for all the types of data is really important, as David discussed. Um, so we have put data for the different apps that we've developed for different sort of sub-disciplines um, into one database, making it easier to search the data, easier to compare data, and most importantly, easier to combine data, data for different types of analyses. Um, and then finally, we didn't want to only remove the obstacles to data upload by making it a part of the natural workflow, but we wanted to provide new tools. We wanted to sort of bribe people to upload their data. And I want to mention that um, our disciplinary communities included our colleagues involved with EPOS, uh, the European Data Management Effort. So the instrument and vocabulary standards and metadata were developed in collaboration with EPOS to ensure that we can find and share data with them as well. So the Strava Spot ecosystem right now consists of three applications. We have Strava Spot Field um, that to, to make maps and collect field data. And it provides the field context for natural samples that are analyzed at the thin section scale 
perhaps using Stribal Micro, as well as for uh, the context for uh, samples deformed by rock deformation experimentalists um, in the laboratory. Uh, researchers characterize the microstructures of samples both deformed in nature and in the lab, and we interpret these microstructures by comparing them with one another, which we can do if they're all stored in one database and observable with one, within one application. Uh, Strabo is open source and open API. Anyone can develop new tools for the um, applications or new tools um, for the data. So this, an example of, this is an example of a tool for quantifying fabrics that was developed by Alan Glasner with Doug Walker. So we wanted to provide um, value added. Um, so we identified with the communities the current challenges to doing work. So for people doing microstructural scale work, um, microstructural scale analyses, um, the big challenge is to look at images that were taken um, from the same sample, but with different analytical um, instruments and taken at different scales and to be, able, to be able to understand how they all fit together. And then the other challenge is to track the spatial locations of these different instrument analyses, the analytical spot on the sample and to connect the data to that specific analytical spot so that you have the, the context of the sample. So this is a screenshot from the Strabo Micro app. So all images appear um, in the navigation pane on the left. The system automatically tracks the spatial nesting of the images. So the top image is a base map and any higher resolution images that were taken from that um, thin section from that sample are nested automatically um, on that base map. And you can see them here and navigate through them. And that can be pictures from higher resolution from the same section, or here, for example, is a um, EBSD produced phase map. And you can see where it fits on the section. It's also possible to group the images in any way you choose. For example, um, using this groups tab here, you could say, I want to look at every sample that has every image that has a garment in it. In it. Um, on the right is the notebook where the data are kept. So with the nesting of the images, we can connect images and data from different instruments and preserve the spatial relations and scale. So here we have uh, photo micrographs from um, an optical microscope. Uh, there is an EBSD phase map, and you can see where it is on this higher resolution image. Over here, it's a backscatter electron image with some microprobe analysis spots, and we can see all the way back to where that those spots are on the original thin section. And all of that is tracked um, through Strabo Micro. So the data are organized by spots, and a spot is an observation or relation with an area of relevance. So a spot can be a point or a line or a polygon. Um, and the data that are associated with each spots are entered here through tabs. And the data can be quantitative or qualitative, whatever you want to put. You can just add any kind of notes that you would like. Um, here you see community vetted vocabulary for the structural geology community. There are also tabs for petrologists, and more can be built out for other disciplines. We can upload files with data that are associated with any of these spots, point lines or polygons. So here is an Excel file with chemical data uh, for this line spot on the backscattered electron image. So these are electron microprobe um, data and the spots that they came from. In addition, you can link um, to any other database if you have um, um, if you have data in EarthChem, for example, you can have the images with the spatially reference points stored in Strabo Micro. So for the um, rock deformation experiment, experimentalists, their community, their main challenge was they needed to standardize their data and the instrument metadata so that they could share their data in a reusable format. And then they also really wanted the ability to upload their data directly from the instrument to the shared database without having to do any work. I think we all want that, really. 
So the work with the experimentalists was in two parts. The first was a community effort to standardize the data and metadata, and this took place over several years with many labs contributing in multiple workshops. Um, so Strabo Experimental is the digital repository for the rock deformation data housed in the same database with Strabo Field and Strabo Microdata. The Strabo portal allows manual input of data for those who prefer it, and some did. In parallel, um, Uling Mok at MIT created LAPS. So LAPS is a framework for storing the experimental data locally in their labs, but its functionality includes um, import export features, which are fully compatible with Strabo Experimental, making it very simple to just upload the data um, when the workers are ready to do that. Upload, uploading the data into the shared data system. Uh, this is the entry page for the Strabo Experimental app. Uh, I just want to point out the Strabo Experimental has an apparatus repository. Um, so this enables faster data entry because the metadata is already preloaded. But it's also a great way to let other people know what instrumentation is available in your lab. And uh, there's also an in instrument repository in the Strabo Micro app. So our goal was to work with the community to build something that um, not only reduced obstacles to upload data, but also provided the tools that the community wanted. Um, along the way, we picked up other geologic disciplines, including petrology, sedimentology, TEFRA, um, whose data and workflow worked with our template. Um, the, the key is that we are using, instead of using a relational database, we're using a graph database um, so that we're able to solve this uh, issue of needing uh, spatially referenced data. Um, so it's an ongoing iterative process with the community. Thanks. Thanks, Julie. Um, we have a really uh, engaging conversation going on in the chat. And so I'll encourage people to continue to look there. If there's one quick question that someone wants to ask uh, Julie while we switch over, someone can go ahead. What graph implementation did you use? Excuse me? You mentioned you use graph. Okay. So I was wondering if I'm you used what, to, what tools did you use? I'm going to have to send you to our programmer, Jason Ash, programmer extraordinaire, to answer that question. Sorry about that. But we can get back to that. Thank, Thank you. you. Perfect. Um, Ted, Ted also asked, is it possible to integrate persistent identifiers for instruments into your data? The where is the question? It's the bottom of the chat. Um, is it possible to integrate persistent identifiers for your data, uh, for instruments into your data? So that's something that we've discussed and would like to include moving forward. It, it should be possible. Yeah, I think David, you're right. Thank you. <laughs> With that, we will, I think, move on to our final speaker. Uh, Paul Genak from University of Arizona will speak on the role of networks to align academic and industry goals. Take it away, Paul. Thank you very much um, for the invitation. This is my first ESIP meeting, and it's been really nice chatting and, and getting to meet people. If you saw my talk on Tuesday, you'll recognize some of the slides, but I'm going to focus this narrative more about how Nocturne has interacted with our industry members and offer some suggestions about how academic and industry goals can be aligned. Um, so Nocturne really came to being with the 2022 Nelson Memorandum uh, outlining the needs to expand data access for uh, federally funded research. Uh, and I should highlight that my, my co-PIs on this project, uh, putting Nocturne together are at the Florida Museum of Natural History, the American Museum of Natural History, and the UTCT facility. And so we collectively have uh, uh, a vested interest in ensuring that the data that's produced from uh, research specimens housed as uh, vouchered resources can be made as available as those actual vouchered resources themselves. And so one of the ways that 
the federal government has realized the 2022 Nelson Memorandum is for the National Science Foundation to organize funding for fair and open science research coordination networks. And it's this process that we used to get Nocturne off the ground. And so I've been using this ESIP meeting as an opportunity to introduce Nocturne to uh, the earth sciences community. In fact, many of our members are earth scientists in the vertebrate paleontology realm. And so we uh, spend time in the field, we collect fossils, we CT scan them, and then it's what we do with those CT data that we have been focusing our efforts on. Uh, our network includes more than 100 computed tomography specialists from around the world, and we use neutron, synchrotron, and X-ray imaging modalities. And our goal is to engage this worldwide community in establishing best practices and gold standards for how to ensure fair and open access to CT data sets. And as part of this work, we work directly with private companies, and I'm going to focus on that aspect of our, uh, our work today. Uh, the private companies we have, and I should say also the 5013Cs, which uh, at least have to be able to fund their operations through their fundraising abilities, uh, are listed here. So we have hardware manufacturers like Zeiss and Nikon. We have repositories for CT data like MorphoBank uh, and MorphoSource. And we have software vendors. So Thermo Fisher recently purchased um, uh, FE, uh, uh, Aviso and Amira from FEI. Hexagon recently acquired VG Studio. Uh, and ORS is a, a popular um, 3D imaging uh, program now that offers free services to those with uh, .edu email accounts. And so we have representatives. Some of them are uh, the leads or, or uh, primary um, public faces for these companies, and some are uh, service folks or um, salespeople that we have longstanding relationships before forming Nocturne. And so how we were able to gain industry buy-in was really threefold, is that we designed the internal uh, structure of Nocturne to be inclusive of industry and vendors from the start. We tried to develop a community whose size and whose scale was of appeal, not just to other academics, but also to industry partners. And we leveraged the history of vendor clientele relationships many of us had with these companies. And we set up a way for Nocturne to continue beyond the funding period, which ends in 2025, so that the commitments that we all make to the network are able to live on and will continue to do the work that we think is really important. And so, uh, as I said on Tuesday, Nocturne is really where the science of CT meets the nuts and bolts of community organization. And I showed uh, this slide here, which is our organizational scheme uh, on Tuesday as well. And the thing that I really want to highlight is that uh, we designed in community interests into Nocturne by organizing ourselves around three major communities. And one of those is the industry and vendors community, with the goal that these would be groups of people who share common interests and could represent those interests within the network with a common voice. Uh, we meet regularly using the same kind of tools we're all have been used to using uh, since uh, lockdown. So we're we're meeting on Zoom. We're continuing conversations on Slack uh, almost 24/7, and we post our outputs on uh, NocturneNetwork.org, which is our website for our deliverables. We meet regularly, and this has been important for maintaining industry connections because we have an opportunity to connect with industry members on essentially a monthly basis. And importantly, we have two all network meetings, uh, one that's online in the fall and a hybrid in person meeting in May. And we use these as ways to have face to face time uh, with our industry partners. I want to highlight our industry and vendors community because it is uh, chaired by a member of industry. Roger Wend is a, a, I think he's the lead sales associate for VG Studio, which is now owned by Hexagon. And so he is you know, pivotal in shaping what the industry and vendors communities interests and goals are within the network. And so he's representing their interests and making sure that they have a voice as Nocturne develops best practices and gold standards. And so, for example, members of the industry and vendors community, as you follow this column downward, are also placed on other subcommittees within the network. So they might have membership on the findability working group or the interoperability working group. And that allows us to shuttle information between these entities within Nocturne so that the interests of, for example, industries and vendors are being heard as uh, interoperability is developing some of its, um, its, its deliverables. We found this to be a very effective approach. Now, the, the network has a whole bunch of deliverables that we're planning or working on. I just want to highlight a few of these for time's sake. Uh, one of them is that we are putting out peer-reviewed papers uh, that 
identify our primary interests, how we're doing this, um, what we think the future of these kinds of relationships looks like, and our vendor partners, our co-authors on these manuscripts. And this has been really important because how we represent the way that software and hardware makes it possible to do our science essentially represents to some extent the values of those industry and vendor communities. And so it's been really important to make sure that we're identifying where is the open source software? Where is it not open source? What are the gaps in the pipelines making the data sets available or the intermediary data sets available? And having uh, vendors as part of our author community has allowed us to more directly incorporate this information. I think it more clearly identifies where it is that we need to uh, fill gaps and what gaps are already being filled. We're also doing a lot to train newcomers to the field. So we're putting together workshops. We're going out to other conferences and spreading the word of Nocturne and bringing in students and trainees to use CT in their research and education uh, initiatives. And this means that we're growing the community. So there's a larger community who may be purchasing the software and hardware in the future from these vendors. So they have a vested interest in participating because they're going to see potentially benefits down the road as the CT community expands. And then really what this is leading to is setting up gold standards for how fair open science data sets can be distributed, used and reused with help from our vendor community because they are often producing the software and the hardware without which we wouldn't be able to collect these data and do our science in the first place. And now, while Nocturne is just, uh, or the funded part of Nocturne is gonna last just three years, our goal from 2025 onward is to fold Nocturne into another organization, uh, one that already exists, the Tomography for Scientific Advancement in North America. Uh, this group also has a UK Europe wing where it originally started. And so Nocturne will become a standing community within the society so that we can continue doing this work. And this means that the time that, and technically expense when you consider personnel uh, salaries that vendors are putting into spending um, uh, on Nocturne is going to have long-term payoffs because Nocturne is still going to be around in five years or 10 years. And so there's an opportunity for us to take on long-term projects that tend to outlast the period, uh, at least the funding period, of a lot of uh, federally funded projects. And the way that we're doing this is that our uh, um, membership includes advisory board members from Tosca. So for example, uh, Jesse Maizano on the left and uh, Ed Stanley, uh, almost all the way to the right, are both PIs on the Nocturne grant. And all four of these, including uh, Stu and Romy, are important um, uh, personas within Nocturne, helping us shape the network so that it can be handed off to uh, Tosca at the end of the funding period. And it's this longevity that is uh, helped us get buy-in from vendors because they know that these conversations aren't gonna be a, a splash in the pan and there are things that we're, we're going to continue onward. Uh, so I'll give you an example. We are right now working on expanding the um, information that could be included in metadata files from CT scanners so that these metadata files, so they're just text files, but they can become the permanent identifier for those CT data sets. They can include the names of everyone involved, including your technicians who did the scanning, the full preparation histories of the samples, uh, and the, the museum voucher information that represents the actual physical object. There's not a lot of in, room for that right now in metadata files, but we have uh, VG Studio and Aviso working on how to implement those within their software. We have Zeiss and Nikon building out the, the text file infrastructure to be able to do that. And then we're hoping that other vendors will uh, take this on as well as they see this as an opportunity to enhance the tools that they're offering uh, to the scientific community. And so we've been very inclusive of uh, our industry and, and vendor members. We've really sought to reach a, a size of community that takes advantage of their interests in, and their need to continue growing their own clientele. And we've used longevity as a way to ensure that what we're starting to build today will grow into benefits for both academics and industry members in the future. Uh, and so with that, I'd like to thank you very much and so thank really everybody who's been involved in Nocturne. Thank you, Paul. That was um, great to hear. And I think the approach that Nocturne is taking, both in terms of um, its structure for the duration of the funding, but also uh, its plans and strategy for ensuring longevity is really compelling. And I think uh, I think there's so many communities. I, I think for my own 
PhD work, like the electron microprobe community could benefit from a similar effort. So um, looking forward to, I think, all the documentation and outputs that come out of Nocturne. Um, does anyone have a, a question for Paul before we move into Jamboard? Okay. There's well, a there's a couple of comments, and I want to I want to echo them because I feel the same way that the industry linkages that you've uh, sort of created are strengthened, and uh, I feel like that's really central to these kinds of efforts. Uh, and you know, the data starts with the instrument, and if the instrument manufacturer is on board uh, and you know practicing fair efforts, uh, that's such a leap forward. And there are a few people in the chat echoing that as well. I'd say that we benefited from the federal government saying they want this, right? It, it, academics on their own haven't really been able to move the needle in a broad sense. I think specific communities have done really well in uh, you know more narrow specific instrumentation context. But as an overall movement, I think we gained a lot of momentum with the Office of Science and Technology policy putting their thumb on the scale. And industry seems to have been responsive to that. And, and I think they're looking for ways to make sure that they're um, not perceived as slowing down what is a collective movement by funding agencies and by scientists. That's great insight. Thank you. With that, um, we are going to move into uh, Jamboard. And so I'm going to briefly pull up our structure here. Um, so we have a Jamboard link that's available in the agenda and uh, the chat. I'll drop in the chat. Um, we have four prompting questions, one per slide. And what we would like you to do for the next um, seven minutes is to uh, type some thoughts in there responding to those questions. And then we're going to come back after seven minutes and address them um, in turn as a, a group. And emphasizing that, you know, Natalie and I have put in some guiding questions, but if there's stuff that we've missed, if there's questions that we should have asked, like put those in too, because uh, we see this as a, like a scoping effort, like where should we best direct our efforts, especially with the researcher in mind, thinking about um, David's presentation about how do we actually incentivize use of these tools for researchers. Um, so yeah, we'll come back together in seven minutes, like Natalie said. Sounds good. And boards. We are going to um, discuss each. We're going to target three minutes for each with the remaining 15 minutes we have in the session um, and saving a little bit more time for the final slide, the final Jamboard. Let's see here. Um, and so this is this is envisioned. We want this to be a discussion. So uh, Christine and I are going to facilitate and you know point out things that we're seeing, but really um, feel free to jump in, unmute or or jump in in the chat with with your thoughts on each of these. Uh, so our first question is really broad scoping, trying to see what people think about what fair data collection means to them um, and what the biggest challenges are. I see some overlap in some of the um, sticky notes here, uh, things like creating PIDs early on in the process, uh, transparency of methods, better usage of data management plans. Yeah, I want to I want to poke at something here. Um, there's there's some things here that are consistent standards, but also disciplinary specific guidance for researchers, you know, highlighting that there's a variety of ways that researchers set their data tables for field work. There are also a variety of different data types and standards out there. Um, we also have uh, one that I think is really important that they've been highlighted as well as them for others, lowering the barriers at the outset for carrying collected data through the entire life cycle. But lowering those barriers for researchers is something we've heard again and again at AGU from our uh, sections. Um, there's also a lack of infrastructure. I think David also highlighted that um, to some extent, RCNs like Nocturne, I think can work to address that, uh, that you know, we need to bring communities together that have the expertise uh, to both uh, work on the data side of this and who the, to connect to the people who are doing the actual data collection and research. 
Erin, did you want to say something? I so see you take your video on. Yeah, I'm a little, I guess, curious. I mean, I thought Devin made great points about the issues and the friction, but I wonder, Christina, if you have a, like, is there a specific example of what lowering the barriers at the outset might look like? Like, is it templates or? Do I have a specific example? I don't know. You know, I'm very new to this uh, space and I think it's different for each discipline and for each section, what that might look like. It looks different for field research than it does for mm -hmm. um, observational networks. Uh, for us, from AGU's perspective as a publisher, we wanna make, you know, sharing your data and software as easy as possible while keeping in mind that FAIR takes work. Yeah, I mean, I think yeah. that these, I really love seeing these stickies that are like, think about it up front. I mean, I think that's maybe the, my current biggest takeaway is this plan ahead um, and think about it when you start makes it much easier when you get to that publication phase. Sorry, somebody else is gonna speak up. Right. Yeah, one, one thing I'll say about lowering the barriers is I, I kind of think about that a little longitudinally relative to like, rather than working on making any individual piece of the workflow like as easy as possible, like if it's a workflow that's going to save people time in the end, people will fight through a hard tool. But it's almost like trying to get to an end to end thing that like shows value that is easy to communicate as quickly as possible. And I, I think the, the workshop um, that Christina and I were at this, uh, um, summer in Boulder, you know, we talked a lot about orchids in this framework because it's a really good example of like, okay, there is a single thing that happened that was created and then everyone sees the value of it now because it's like, oh, this saves us time, you know, and it's not not super huge or flashy or something, but you can easily communicate, this is a thing that saves you time. And then that kind of says, okay, well, we want more of that. How do we, what are the next steps and that sort of thing? So I think, Thinking about like end-to-end -end pipelines is, is one way that I would frame that. Yeah, I think that's great. And, you know, we, uh, one of the classes we teach at AGU for people getting started in open science about managing your digital presence with your ORCID. Uh, Carl Benedict. Sure. And yeah, the lowering barriers comment was mine. And um, when I, I was thinking about it and that, when that was actually part of the context for the question that I posed to Aaron in the chat in terms of, um, machine readable DMPs being able to then feed into um, the pipeline of work throughout the entire project. Because one of the significant barriers that we've encountered with many researchers is the metadata ask um, and the participation in the collection of metadata that in the vast majority of the work that we end up Find ourselves finding ourselves supporting here at UNM is pretty much after the fact. And that ends up being a huge hurdle for both being able to get quality documentation, but also being able to get any at all. And so that ends up being a barrier to actually hitting any of the fair <laughs> principles in terms of the results coming out of that research. So thinking about how we can have a, a data management plan that can be leveraged as input into the um, the metadata baked into a data management system for extracting and automating the, the development of at least core components of metadata and re recognizing that we still need to have an ask for the sort of higher level uh, more intellectual components rather than, you know, having to continue to dig down into the, the technical elements that we can hopefully build into the pipeline. That was sort of what, those are some of the things I was thinking about in terms of lowering barriers is starting from the beginning and automating that, that process as much as possible, which I think we're seeing some good examples of here and how do we start to, you know, even broaden the, the use of models like that. I think that's spot on, Carl, and, uh, you know, projects like Sparrow are doing a great job in that. And I think that's why the instrument manufacturer connection is so important as well. Uh, Ted, do you want to jump in really quickly before we move on? Yeah, I think, Carl, you know, one of the important things about metadata asks is that we actually have to be thinking about metadata benefits. Um, and, and hopefully that makes the answers to the asks more easily. But 
you know, one of the things Aaron mentioned, we've been looking at project metadata and using data site for project metadata. I just wanted to also mention, um, Christina and Davin mentioned the workshop we are all at this summer for instrument identifiers and the, the, the data site metadata schema that was just released this week, version 4.5 has, has um, those instrument identifiers using data site DOIs for instrument identifiers is now sort of in, in the schema. So I, I think that data site for projects, data site for instruments, data site for data, and data site for samples, um, you know, that's a great infrastructure that's out there that we can take advantage of. Uh, and that is generally underutilized in a lot of ways. So I would, I look forward to seeing benefits show up there. Thanks, Christina. Thanks, Ted. I think so, one thing to mention about that workshop, uh, just so it doesn't seem like we're trying to report out from that workshop since so many of us are here, uh, but they are prepping a workshop report. Uh, and I, at least one of my takeaways from, from that project was that uh, PIDs for instruments and facilities are a start, not the end of the question, but maybe the focus of that project. Uh, Natalie, sorry, go ahead. Um, I was just going to move us forward in the interest of time uh, to some of our other uh, slides. I think this one, one thing I find interesting is uh, I expected, I did not expect necessarily a dominance of things in the already exists uh column so i think under the missing category and maybe it's the use of the word resources but we also have solutions under the missing category i'm seeing an emphasis on development of data standards and also standards for uh data management plans um and then some conversation uh about funding but i think that if we keep we should keep these in mind as we move forward to some of these other slides as potential directions for uh more immediate actions. I think potentially moving forward. Yeah, this. I think we have the researcher stakeholders uh, pretty well represented here and uh, also a comment about one geochemistry facilitating dialogue between labs, instrument manufacturers, repositories, key elements here. And so uh, one thing that we would really like to have discussion about and hear from is uh, what outcomes people would like to see and and talking about whether there's a role for ESIP here and what that would look like, whether um, some of this work should be taken up by an existing cluster or clusters or whether there's a unique enough needs and a critical enough mass of people uh, for maybe considering a new cluster. And recognizing that there's a lot of different topics being covered here. There is, uh, we already mentioned the Research Data Alliance interest group for fair data from instruments is sort of an umbrella over a lot of these topics. I think one thing to consider is, is there an outcome that we haven't yet covered by an ESIP cluster? Is there an output uh, from this kind of discussion, whether it's uh, an evaluation of all the tools that already exist to connect labs to repositories, or recommendations for connecting those tools to existing repositories, as came up in the chat quite a bit. Uh, I think it needs to be, I, there's a, a suggestion here that the topic is focused and new, suggests new cluster. And it would be interesting for that person to speak up and say what they think the, the focus of the topic and the focus of the cluster would be. Not to call you out, but I did. Yeah, this is Ram. I am the one who put that up there. From hearing all the presentations today, it looked like uh, the uh, problems that are being considered here are somewhat unique that have not been considered by other clusters. Uh, you know, relationship between the um, uh, instrument labs and uh, their data management and so on are somewhat slightly different from the other kinds of things that we do like managing large remote sensing data sets and so on. So I figured that this would be a useful thing to have a separate cluster. I think that's a really good point. Like maybe the connection to the instrument manufacturers is something that hasn't uh, necessarily been explored uh, enough. I'll, and maybe a good 
activity for a cluster would be to bring together the efforts in that direction. Kirsten, please jump in. Yeah, I mean, I'm, my question is, if other things are happening outside ESIP, how far does ESIP need something on its own or should the, the ESIP community rather participate in something that's already happening? I, I'm, you know, in this community of geo-analytical data, there's already such a big fragmentation, even with subdomains and paleoclimate analyses and geochronology versus geochemistry and petrology and mineralogy. Uh, I, I always raise a flag and say, let's work together and not just try to do something else out there. So that would be my contribution. <laughs> I agree, Kirsten. Do you have any uh, further suggestions for how we can better work together, whether that's under uh, World Fair umbrella, RDA umbrella, ESIP umbrella, something else entirely? Um. I think that needs to needs a session, but not another cluster. That's that that would be my, you know some dedicated discussion how we can come together and maybe even you know trying to find funding for a workshop. Uh, it could be just like a, a virtual workshop uh, where we can discuss what really is out there. I mean, looking at this this particular slide here. Um, elaborating on that and figuring out how we can work together and if we really need something else or if we can uh, latch on to what's already happening out there. I'm obviously biased with one geochemistry. I see that as a um, as an effort that can be leveraged as much as you know the uh, the the RDA interest group. Uh, we're talking about images. There is nocturne already out there, so you know, it, it's it's already so fragmented. I would rather like a discussion and how we can better integrate all these different discussions into um, you know um, an ongoing dialogue. That's a great point, um, David, and then Leslie. And I know we're coming up towards the end. In fact, it just turned over. Yeah, I mirror um, a lot of what. Kirsten just said, uh, you know, and I happen to know that uh, like last week there was a discussion in like the German paleontology circle that I was vaguely aware of, of like inventorying tools uh, for managing data things that, you know, there's so many different subfields to think about in this stuff. And so the one type of organization that I feel like could be really valuable here is an organization explicitly designed to like, um, be aware of and build connections and like say you should work with you and you should work with you and you should work with you um you know and just kind of like some sort of central clearinghouse where you know we can just kind of referee a very wide thing where not everyone needs to be aware of everything all the time because there's you know kind of people who are building those connections so if we can and maybe that's through one geochemistry um or some other organization you know but but something that like um just that kind of clearinghouse uh would be a great thing. And to that's have, actually, I'm not sure if Leslie is going to say that now, but that's something that One Geochemistry started on its website is a directory of best practices in different communities and for different sample types. L Leslie, sorry. Uh, I'll jump in really quick before Leslie and say that I want to just pitch our RDA Fair Data from Instruments interest group here because that's exactly the kind of function that an interest can group can serve both for multiple disciplines and internationally. Uh, so maybe we can have a, a further conversation about that. Uh, Leslie, go ahead. Um, okay, I'd just like to make two points. So one of the things with one geochemistry is because they're in World Fair, which obviously has a thing on fair, is that through that we are, as Kirsten said, connecting with the International Union of Pure and Applied Chemistry. And they've got so many chemical standards that we could adapt. The second thing is I've seen a lot of conversations with um, we need to talk to the instrument manufacturers, et cetera. Well, again, One Geochemistry did that at um, Goldschmidt in Hawaii a couple of years ago. I think the most sobering thing was that we found a few of the instrument manufacturers were saying, yes, yes, we need to start moving off proprietary standards, but will you as a community speak in one voice? Because what they find is, you know, everyone wants their pet standard. 
And I almost felt like they can see the advantages, but they're not hearing a coherent voice. So how do we harmonise that coherent voice um, to get it together, which, of course, is one of the aims of um, one geochemistry. But I will warn you, because I've done geophysics standards, all sorts of standards in my career, the most heterogeneous community in the earth sciences is the geochemistry analytical labs community because you're long tail, you're small, and you can fit a you know, lifetime's work of data on a thumb drive. And so you've never been forced to face these issues that geophysics have where you have shared um, data infrastructures to store the data. But yeah, that's kind of what I'm saying is try as Kirsten said, oh God, let's not start another group. Just try and see if we can coordinate within what's already out there. And Leslie, I think you make a, a really good point that I've heard echoed by a number of others who are involved in this work, particularly Raphael Ritz, uh, who is involved in organizing these uh, this coalition, exactly what you speak of, uh, to work with manufacturers uh, for instruments to, um, to set these standards uh, out of Germany. Uh, he's involved in our RDA interest group. But uh, I want to let that be the last word. We'll come back to this topic. And uh, if you're interested in staying in touch with the next steps, leave your name in the session notes. Uh, and maybe the next time you'll see us, we'll be uh, co coordinating a session where we can bring all these disparate efforts together once more. Thank you all again so much for joining us. Thank you to our speakers. Uh, thank you to Kirsten for joining us at the last minute to speak about One Geochemistry. I really appreciate all your time and attention. And thanks, Isip and Megan, as well. Um, have a great rest of your day.